small child walking on great aunts and uncles. They lined up like foothills on our flowered divan, the great ones, overflowing the kitchen chairs and footstools that continued in a circle across the front room linoleum, and I climbed up to travel the uneven track of their laps. I trod on the scruffy ones, the gap-toothed, the jowly, the oblong of bosom who smelled of talcum and coffee, those who laughed themselves red in the face. I walked across the paunchy and the ones with unruly hair, the warty, the blemished, the slope-shouldered and dew-lapped, those whose breath came out in little gasps. I traversed shaky lipstick and eyebrows drawn on in pencil, the bald, bespectacled, chinless, those with an air of motor oil and fish bait, with huge meaty hands and overinflated fingers, those who scraped under their nails with knife blades, the ones who laughed hard in odd wheezes and grunts, the ones who laughed merely by shaking. Mine was a road of scratchers and nodders, a pathway of great jiggling elbows, of the stubby, of the widow's peaked, of gaping black nostrils, a fleshy track suffused with tobacco and bacon grease. These were the ground I walked on, mine underfoot, and though dead are still mine, and will persist as mine, though I be trod with them, though I be dust. All right, welcome to another uh, edition of uh, Poets in Montana, and today we have Lauren Graham with us. And uh, thank you, Lauren. That was that uh, that particular book was from Places I Was Dreaming. This is your last collection. Yeah, and, that's right. right. Yeah, and uh, uh, I love that poem. <laughs> I especially love to hear it out loud too, because it it brought back all those. Uh, all those sensory images in particular for me. You know, it's like, uh, and, and I thought to myself as I was listening to it, I thought, do, do people, do young people now have these kinds of recollections? I mean, do those kinds of people still exist in the world? The, all those smells, you know? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but I was just, um, I, I went to this, um, I went to this really uh, dive kind of restaurant one day, and I yeah. and, uh, and with 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 my wife, who was my girlfriend then, and right. I was looking around, and I was going, you know, these people all look like my relatives. <laughs> and I started thinking about, okay, look at that guy. You know, he's got hair that comes down like Eddie Munster or something. You know, right, it's like, right. yeah, my uncle's got that. And right. so, first thing you know, I'm working on a poem about my yeah. relatives and a kind of a book about my relatives and, right. and, and, and my family, though fictionalized, so I could just make up stuff whenever I felt like it. But, right, right. Um, but that's what that whole book, Places I Was Dreaming, is, just sort of... Yeah, um, combination of... Just a rural upbringing in poverty with a big extended family. That's what right. it's about. And, right. and right. I read that book uh, at various places, and, and people say to me all the time, I have exactly the same kind of family right. you have. Right, right. <laughs> and I thought, I, I, I was the only one. No, yeah. I'm not even close to the only one. <laughs> no, no, I, and I, that's, what, that's what makes me kind of think to myself, I wonder if it is a, a generational kind of a, of a slice of existence. Because I think of <laughs> you know, my next door neighbor, uh, oh my God, I don't know when he ever took a bath. <laughs> but but you know, and he wore wool yeah. all year round. Yeah. He wore wool. He started. He changed into cotton long underwear for the summer. <laughs> oh well, but nice. basically, and and uh, and he had this old sour dog, and <laughs> and his wife had that thick plastic yeah. that she put on the furniture because well, of course she did. because oh <laughs> he's gonna sit on it. <laughs> yeah, and, and just the, all those smells. Yeah, I don't know. That's, yeah, that's that's a terrific poem. Well, thanks. I, I think that um, I think that people always remember stuff about their family, though the smells might not be as well uh, and, and profound it, 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 as it, those it, it are. It is the <laughs> sensory stuff that yeah. triggers our, yeah. our our memory too. No, you know? smell especially yeah, yeah. will make you remember lots so. of things. Yeah, and I'm losing my smell as time goes on. <laughs> oh, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I thank you for joining us today. I mean, I, just did. a few background things. Uh, you are over at Carroll College. Taught at Carroll College for 22 years wow. now, so, yeah, exactly. and I'm still there, continuing for I don't know how long, how much longer, but a while. Yeah, and and you uh, you grew up in Oklahoma, is that right? Yeah, I grew up in rural Oklahoma, uh, in, in as I said before, in a, in a family with uh, with no money basically right. at all. Right. Uh, especially when I was a, when I was really little, and uh, yeah, I, I grew up, went to college there, and uh, moved to Texas when I was in my twenties, and then moved to Virginia, and then moved here because yeah. Carroll College had a job and. Right, right. I you applied need, for it and I got it. Job. I needed yeah. a job. Yeah, totally. So. Yeah. Well, when did when did you uh, uh, first develop sort of this poet mind or or desire to express it or? Oh, I I I think it's probably almost always been with me. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, because I remember I was trying to write poems when I was. I don't think that I could write the poems down yet because I didn't know how to read. Right. But I was right. already making right. up poems about my cat and, and my dog and stuff like right. that. And, the, right. and there, there are all kinds of poems about my dog in this, in here. His name was Elvis because yeah. Yeah. Uh, I asked my dog. And was, dad, was that your dog's name? Yeah, that was yeah, my dog's yeah, name. Yeah, that's yeah. A great because detail. my dad brought the puppy home and I said, What's that dog's name? And he said, Elvis Presley. And I wouldn't let him change it after that. Were you <laughs> I didn't even know who that was. Were, I was a little were, were kid. You, were you exposed <laughs> to music young? Or? Yeah, um, uh, uh, people played music in our house all the time. So right, there was right. always somebody with a guitar or, uh, or, or a banjo. Usually it was a guitar. Right. It was kind of a rite of passage for males in my family. You have to learn to play the guitar at least a little bit, or you're yeah. not really a grown up. So, <laughs> so okay. So I, I did my bit. I learned too. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of songs. A lot, a lot of singing. A lot of singing. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of singing um, with the guitar, but also just people singing while they did chores, and people right. singing while they weeded the garden, and right. you know, washed the dishes, and right. and so on right. and so on, and so yeah. you just get a sense of the rhythm of language from that, mm -hmm. and then right. yeah, you're you're on your way to being a poet already, and I you think don't so, even know yeah. what that is. <laughs> right, it's just it's the seeds are planted. Yeah. right, they're in your head. All yeah. that that musical language yeah. stuff going yeah. on. No, it sounds a certain way, and you yeah. and you can't take it seriously if it doesn't sound that way so okay right and I write prose too which is not like that but uh, right but and and going back through uh, I mean uh, before I prepared myself <laughs> in the way that I extensively prepare for these things hours I, I'm I prepared sure. <laughs> myself by rereading you know your books and uh, you are in in book form you are basically a narrative poet I mean, you're a storytelling mm -hmm. poet. Yeah, because yeah. I come from a family of storytellers, right? And um, and that's that shot through through places I was dreaming too. Because yeah. uh, if you, well, you have to play the guitar. But the other way you get you got the marks of respect and and the respect of my family is if you could entertain people, and what they liked the best was a good story. Right. So when I was a little kid. I would make up stories about bears, about meeting bears in the woods, which of course I didn't really do. I knew perfectly well I didn't do it, but I would tell everybody, you know. So they would come over to the house and they would and and and, and say hi to me. Have Have you killed any bears lately? And I would spin some yarn with a bear in it. So, <laughs> oh, that's great because I mean, I, I you know, interestingly enough, I have a nephew. He's only like uh, about eight years younger than me because my sister was like 11 or so years older than me. And uh, that's what he did. I mean, he was, yeah. and, and he always had, he had a gun with him. And he's, he's like four, <laughs> three, four years old. And people would come up to him and yeah. say, how you doing today, Rick? And he'd go, been hunting bears. <laughs> he'd tell yeah. this that, that bear hunting me. story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, how about something like that from, uh, yeah. you want to read about something like that from yeah, Places sure. in Dreaming? Sure, yeah. I think there's, uh, I think there's a couple in here like that. There's Elvis. Uh, yeah, there's <laughs> Elvis, <laughs> uh, and uh, um, uh, let's see. Um, 
Well, here's one called Bear Stories. How would that be? That's a good All start. Right. Yeah, okay. This is Bear Stories. When the bear bulbs on wires in the high ceilings flickered and sooty water dripped from the flue hole and lightning broke so hard you saw a part of God through the jagged cracks that lit the clouds green and black like a bruise, we all would go down in Aunt Lucy's storm cellar among her jars of beet pickles and strawberry jam until the tornadoes had passed, a circle of kitchen chairs in the half light of a coal oil lamp. Uncle Short telling the one about the twister that turned an old boy's house into toothpicks and left him in the bathtub without a scratch on him. And Aunt Gertie, how a storm had left the house alone but tore the cellar out of the ground and killed everyone in it. And in spite of my being five, they'd ask if I'd killed any bears lately. And I'd allow how I'd shot at one and missed and that bear got so mad he'd busted my gun all to pieces over a stump and I finally had to jump off a cliff into the water to get shut of that dang bear and everybody'd laugh and some cousin would say, it's about stopped. And we'd peek out the door at the leaves and twigs scattered about down the driveway, Aunt Lucy saying, well, the old house is still standing and we'd go home, the lightning just some flickers now far off to the east. Right. Yeah. So I, I think stories, I mean, that, that's where you got right. a lot of stories was in the storm cellar, which in Oklahoma in those days, it's like every other night you were down yeah. there. Yeah. And, you know, because you didn't have, right. you know, Doppler radar or anything, you didn't know if there was really one coming or not. It, or, or, or what was to be expected from yeah, it. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, no idea. So you just went, okay, it looks pretty bad. Let's go get in the storm cellar. Right. And then you'd, well, what are you going to do down there? Yeah. You know, yeah. well, that. You're yeah. going to tell each other stories. That's right. what. Right, and, and uh, it's, it's kind of cool that they were, you know, somewhat related to uh, being scared or, or, or the storm or they were very dramatic. Yeah, and, and no. Most good stories are That's, always. Yeah, it's a way of, you know, De making, with fear making or, the threat mm, receive. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. You know, so, I mean, they're... they're um, there are monsters in this world, and telling stories is, yeah. you know, all the way back to Beowulf and beyond, how you, <laughs> how right. you dispel the monsters is right. you tell a story, right. and the monsters go away, at least for a minute. Yeah, right. Keep them at bay. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the first book, your first book, uh, your first book was called Moe's. Mm-hmm, Moe's. Yeah, and, uh, it, it, you know, the uh, the impetus for this book, which is just a, it's like one long poem in a way, broken it up is. into days, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and, right. Uh, days yeah, in a prison sentence. Right, days in a prison sentence. So so it's a very much a, a long kind of a narrative that's, that's written in, in, uh, in poet fo poetry form. What... Uh, what was the input? I mean, where, where did that come from? It's well, just a... I, you know, when yeah. you think about where these things come from, right, you right, never right, really right. know the answer exactly. But, <laughs> right. but what happened was that I had been writing these just jewel-like poems, just sort of really short, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just really... Self-contained. Um, yeah, you know. Compressed. Four or five lines sometimes, just trying to make them as small and perfect as I possibly could, right. which really was a way of learning the craft of poetry. Right. And then when I went to graduate school, um, I, I just sort of said, I, I'd like to go completely the opposite direction from that now <laughs> and do yeah. something that's not like what I've done before. Right. And so I had this uh, campus job. Uh, which was I had to inventory computers, and this was back in the day when a computer might consist of a teletype with a screen attached to it, you know, so <laughs> you're going around finding all this junk that was cobbled together. Right. Uh, and uh, so um, I was, you know, checking off the list of computers, and so some, some guy in the hospital gave me a cigar because his wife had just had a baby. Mm -hmm. And I'd forgotten my lunch that day, so I went out to my car, and I lay down in the back seat with my feet out the w back window, and I smoked that cigar and thought about what my next poem should be. Uh -huh. And I thought about... Um, well, if I want to do something long, so narrative might be my friend, and that would be good. So 
then I started thinking about epics and romances and, you know, sort of other long poem forms from the past. Big, big stories. Yeah, and then I went, okay, yeah, I mean, uh, um, a romance is the story of a knight, a knight errant, a knight right. on a task, on a, you know, on the job. Uh, and I went, um, what, if, what if I had a knight errant, but he couldn't move? Uh, and so I went, well, okay, why couldn't he move? You know, just, you know, <laughs> thinking. Yeah, right, right. And, right. well, he couldn't move because he's in prison, and I taught in the prison system in Texas when there I was down go. there, and so I knew something about that. Right. And mm -hmm. most of what's in the book doesn't have very much to do with what it's really like there. It just sort of got certain yeah. things started. Yeah, and it, and, uh, and it really takes off... Just in the head of this character, and of course, you know, like like all characters in prison, he's innocent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, right. But uh, well, the but, difference with Mose though is he doesn't think he is exactly. But right. it, you read it and you go, well, I'm not sure you really belong there. I mean, you right. well, well, you didn't don't really you don't do really, anything that you bad. don't really know anything until you get towards towards the end. Yeah, right. right. Which is, uh, but but I I'm so we're actually tipping people off. Yeah, well that's all right. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, it's, it was just interesting uh, th because it's just like one real long intensive character development that we sort of go through in verse form. Pretty much. Yeah. 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 Uh, so it's kind of a it's a it's a different epic. Yeah. Poem. No. I used to call it a soap epic. Yeah, <laughs> it's it was like a soap opera in some ways because mm -hmm. he's so many twists and turns in his story right. because he has this very troubled relationship with his father and, and also with, with the church and also with this woman that he's in love with. But she has become his sort of his, what, sister, not exactly, but just because his his father and her mother married each other after right. Right. Mose and Gracie were already a couple, and so now he feels guilty about that. Right, she's not really a yeah, stepsister, she, but she, he calls her that. Yeah, but yeah. that's what he says, because right, he's, right, right. um, he's not very educated, Mose. Exactly. He's really smart, but not, not educated, and so he right. doesn't know what to call her. So, right. so he says stepsister, but that's, that's not right. Right. Well, I, I, th I just think uh, w w we, should, uh, we should hear a little bit from, from Mose. Yeah, okay, good. You know, may maybe, uh, and I don't know where, you know, a sequence or uh, if there's any particular spot that you think would be a... Uh, well, I've read well, from the beginning before just because then you don't have to explain anything. <laughs> right, right. Whatever you, where do you think um, you want to start? Yeah, I think, I think, that, I think that's good. Um, uh, it's... Um, the, the, the cantos, the sections of the poem, are uh, labeled with numbers, which we, we learn as we read here, mm -hmm. are him counting down the days that's left in his sentence. So it starts with 1741, 1741 days left. Right. You don't know that yet, but you're about to find out pretty fast. So. Right. So that's why it goes that way. So this is Mose, the beginning of Mose anyway. 1741. Dear Gracie, do you hate me for it? Mose smashes the yellow legal page into a ball and reaches for the dead cigarette, whose smoke still lingers, clings on his hair and the bar bars of his cell and the one light bulb in its wire cage. Mose Peterson, bewildered in the Texas Department of Corrections, lost in the letter to the woman whose face swirls in his mind on the long days while the heels of his hands harden on a shovel handle and the sun darkens his neck and the back of his white uniform. He stares at the sunburn on the top of his arm and waits, thinking how the lights go out precisely at 10 and without regard. He begins again. Listen, Gracie, I just wanted Look, Gracie, I won't bother. Dear Gracie, I... 1740. Whistle of brakes in the peanut field, Mose in white cotton, last name stenciled in black over shirt pocket and hip pocket, stands in the cross hatches of shadow the dawn makes through the steel mesh windows of the whitewashed cracker box school bus 
slips the smokes he rolled on the way into the camel pack in his front pocket, comes at last to the door and the impossible breadth of central Texas, the scarlet lip of its horizon, the big trusty like a tower on the back of the roan stallion, bullwhip coiled in his fist, the riflemen across the gravel road shading their faces with the brims of cowboy hats, Mose, M Moses' mind muttering, Dear Gracie, dear Gracie. 1729, dear Gracie, I can't talk to you on some things. There ain't no use to try and explain. It's just how the darkness comes suddenly as always, and Mose lies down with his thoughts as always, alone among criminals, himself criminal, feeling that suits him like a hand-me-down, except when he remembers the blackness that descended on him unexpected when guilt rose to hang like a celestial stranger watching over his shoulder. He draws a long breath, closes his eyes, and sees himself, a small boy throwing the switch, trying to leap into bed before the light was gone. The dark is fast, he says in a whisper, into the same black-lettered white pillow that alone hears when Mose laughs once in a blue moon in his sleep. 1726, he names his days in descending order, days left in a five-year sentence, calls them by number as though they were years, 1726. Dear Gracie, I've been here a hundred years and still can't tell you why I, he reflects a moment, pulls the page loose and proceeds. Dear Gracie, anything I might say after these hundred days would be just like he bends, unconvinced, to retrieve the dropped pencil. When my old man would make me read the Bible, Adam begat Cain and Cain, Abel, and so forth. He shakes his head slowly, tells himself again that words are hopeless, stretches his fingers, writes. Dear Gracie, it's hard to start this letter, so I'll begin with now and circle back to explanations. 1722, they say the captain sent our steers to slaughter long since. Mose concentrates briefly on the drip of the lavatory, blunt end of the pencil against his lip. But all we've seen for meat is more rabbit. They say we deserve a share of what we helped raise. He suppresses a doubt that scales his spine and presses the pencil lead harder into the page but they say it low. You may not believe it, but there are worse places you can still disappear to if you raise much hell. He surrenders at last to self-intrigue, reviews the lines, and reconvenes his misgivings. But I know you may not see. Maybe I don't know what I mean. They say you can get worms if you eat bad rabbit. I'll stop there. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's great, man. I, I have an inclination to applaud, so, but I, I'll, I'll hold off. <laughs> okay. But no, that, that, that was that was nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, just because you hear a, it was nice. We just we just spent twenty days, roughly there, almost or something, some of that uh, neighborhood. Yeah. And got a taste of of what's going on with him in his mind and what he's trying to do, which is communicate with the yeah. woman he loves. Absolutely. And he doesn't know how to do that for some, some so reason. So many people don't. <laughs> and, and obviously he hasn't received a letter from her recently. <laughs> no, no. No, and he never gets a letter from her. So, uh, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, we skip a lot of days. So uh, right. my, my friend uh, 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 Laura Gray Street would say that this, uh, this she said this, this, was, this was a strobe poem. Because yeah. the light flashes on for just a second, and you see what he's doing, and then it's black right. again. And then there's another second, and these can be days apart. And, yeah, yeah. that was kind of the idea. Which is, not, which is not a difficult concept with a prison situation. Yeah. Right. I mean, the days are, I mean, if you got something going on exciting, you're going <laughs> to yeah, write about right. it, right? And if not, yeah. it's like, yeah. Something nothing, happened today. Nothing yeah. today, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, so those are uh, 
I mean, that Moses, your first book, and that was like yeah. mid '90s or something like that. I think it said. Yeah, yeah, it was published in 1995. It says '94, but it came out late. Right. You, you know how publishers yeah, work. Yeah, you know, yeah. so yeah. they get the wrong date in it. But uh, yeah, then, it was '95. And then uh, places uh, I was dreaming is your is your last book. Yeah, which was 2015. Kevin Carey. Uh huh. Press. Kevin Carey Press, my current publisher. They're great. All right. They make a beautiful book. Oh, they really make a that nice a, book. Yeah, I love these, always like these. Yeah, little, you know, I these like those little, little flaps, jobs. too. And they which did is, the cover, too, which was, uh, did they, they just sent yeah. me that and said, what do you think of this? And I thought, oh, that's pretty good. You yeah, know, there's good. tracks in the, in, the, in the pasture, but they don't start from anywhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. they st and they back perfectly out. <laughs> yeah, how'd they do that? Yeah. And then, and then you have a book in the middle. Yeah. Which is called The Ring Scar. The Ring Scar, yeah. And, uh, and this book is an interesting collection of a variety of looking sonnets. Huh? Yeah. Sort of? Yeah, no, I think of it as sonnets and anti-sonnets. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, there's plenty uh, of that. And, and so, uh, yeah, because it's a, it's, it's a book uh, with alternating poems in the voices of a divorcing couple. Ah. And okay. his are all sort of straight sonnets, and hers are all 14 lines, th things that Fracturing. don't seem like very yeah, much yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, of a sonnet. Of. But well, for, formally, up. formally yeah. anyway, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think that's a, an interesting project. Yeah, so it was, it was based on, there's a, a poem in there called Imaginary Conversations, where he's thinking about how you talk to people mm -hmm. that aren't there. Right. <laughs> They're, they're living people, but they're not present. But right. there's something you have to say to that person, and it doesn't matter whether they listen to it or not. Right. And, the, you know, if you're getting a divorce, well, you know who that person's going to be. So, yeah. so the, it's, the idea is that they're both kind of talking to each other, but the other one can never hear. Yeah. And so we just hear what she th would say to him, if she could say anything to him, and what he would say to her, and it just keeps going back and forth and back and forth. And... Then over the course of, of, the, of the sequence, it's a sequence, yeah. um, series of related poems that, you know, they sort of get finished with each other. Yeah. And yeah. Um, she has a dream at the end that they're walking up, that they can walk up into the sky as though the, there were just steps in the air and they, they're just, they just walk up there and then they just go away from each other. Yeah. <laughs> and that's... Yeah. How it ends. So. Well, that's cool because I because I didn't I I really did I mean I read both of those books completely and then I just picked at these. Yeah. You know, reading, uh, noting the blurb on the back. You know, talking about the sonnet form and uh, you know whatnot. And I just I didn't. Uh, so this needs to be read from cover to cover. To really yeah, read. it's I a mean, narrative. It's too. another project mm -hmm. kind of a of of a poem of a book. Yeah, I I I was writing these. Um, these books that were all related poems mm -hmm. from the start of my career. I was right. doing that one, now everybody does it, but I was right. doing that one right. when John Berryman had done it, and that's where I got it from, but right. nobody else was doing it. And I went, wow, that's a pretty good way to operate because you don't have to start over every day <laughs> right. when you're doing a collected poems kind of book. Right. You, you yeah. gotta start completely over every time you sit down and it's like wow. Right. And then uh, the assembly of it is just like a puzzle. Yeah, you know? right. Whereas something like this kind of flows. Yeah, you know, like, no, you're you're writing you may not be writing them in order, but you're writing some, writing some more, mm -hmm. thinking about where those should go in relation to each other. And then you're thinking about what has to go between them. Mm -hmm. So how do I get from this one to that one that I've already written with the ones that I haven't written yet? And all of these books have been like that. Right. That's yeah. been just the way I work. And then, and then that's really not the way I'm working now. <laughs> so, right. okay. okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. you change, of so, course. So, so this one, in a way, is, a, like you say, a conversation between yeah. two different voices. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and I tried, I tried very much with the forms of these poems to use that to make them sound different from each other mm -hmm. yeah. so they don't sound like one person talking all the time. Right, and I mean, I, 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 I'm interested in hearing you uh, read a couple of these okay. too. You know, sim simply uh, f for that, uh, those, those breaks that, uh, you know, I mean, those, that, that 
it was not a cesura, but what? what yeah, what it's you, a cesura. Okay, I'll call okay. It that. Yeah. Uh, 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 the modern equivalent of that, yeah, anyway, right. in, in, that I start, started seeing about 20, 25 years ago mm -hmm. or so, whatever. But it's like a, it definitely uh, is going to be a pause, a longer yeah. pause than yeah. a comma. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Let's, let's, yeah. let's have a couple of those poems. Yeah. She, um, she has uh, she has this sort of halting way of talking, mm -hmm. right. uh, like she doesn't know for sure what she's going to say next, mm -hmm. and that's what mm -hmm. really all the mm -hmm. sisuras are is when she's reaching for the right word, yeah. and and he's um, and he's he's more fluid than that, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. but less careful. I right. would say he right. sometimes says things that you go, okay, he should have what, what are you talking about? <laughs> I yeah. Thought about that. <laughs> So uh, this is the, um, what, this is, uh, his name is Don, by the way, her name is Emmy, and so this is the first Emmy poem in the book, and I'll read that in the first Don poem, and then I can continue if we think that's a good idea still. <laughs> um, so her first poem is called The Past, the Icicle. I thought I could melt it. In the right spring, thaw, given a city that makes its own weather, the job new, the phone, my rings newly in a matchbox, the address new, furniture, clothes, new side of our history shrinking, dripping, running out downspouts, down storm drains, down river, ocean, and goodbye. What water does, what I wanted, that icicle of oil to do, that mounted the air instead, in its defrosting rose, evolved its own cycle, to come down in dribs and drabs, on all in my gaze, on the crowds I brush through, thinking somehow you also have passed by on the street where old cobblestones show through tar in a tunnel far below where subway trains pass a greasy flutter of light a film off the sprocket a man in your coat and glasses standing silent, like a newspaper holding onto the rail, which bears the same grime that settles everywhere. That's, that's how Emmy talks. Mm -hmm. Don talks like this. Okay. Straight sign. A language of birds. Oh, for a language of birds to say ourselves, to call us as the chickadee calls itself, chickadee -dee, and the phoebe likewise, and the whippoorwill, and the jay. Or to summon ourselves in a subtler vein, the tohe with his endless drink your tea, or that low trembling whistle in which we perceive the misnamed screech owl's secret name. Could we then meet ourselves in all of these and form from them that one call of our own that would lay claim to us? And would it shear away the distance and the constant drone of traffic and TV? And would we hear again the flicker's laughter in the trees? That's that's Don and Emmy. That's how okay. they go. Okay, two different folks. He's uh, she she lives in a city we don't know where. It never tells us. He lives in the country we don't know where. It never tells us. Right. There's a mountain between them. That's one of the poems. It's called the mountain between us. Mm -hmm. But we don't we can't figure out exactly where they live. She lives somewhere big enough to have a subway. Right. If she just right. mentioned it. Right. But, right. Right. But or at least she's thinking about it. So more urban images. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. that was one of the things I was thinking about with the poem is all of these sort of binaries, you know, sort of, you know, him and her, right. and then, uh, you know, 
city and country or country right. and city, right. you know, right. and, and, you know, and so on and so on, you know, the way he thinks about nature and she thinks about urban landscape and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so on and mm -hmm. so on. Another way to try to make them not sound like each other. Right. Is the, is the title poem, is that his poem? Yeah, the, the title ring poem scar? is his poem. Yeah, the yeah. ring scar. Should, shall, should, should I read that yeah, one yeah, if yeah. I can read, find read, it? Read <laughs> well, I haven't read from this book in a while. Um, there it is. Um, the ring scar. It's referring to that um, place that's left on your hand when you take your ring off. Yeah, you know? I know what you're talking yeah, about. <laughs> yeah. So here's what he says about it. The ring scar. It should have disappeared by now, this faint line of pale skin where my ring used to ride, but it persists. It faded overnight from my palm, but on, my, but on the back of my hand, part of me most familiar, it has remained for months. Indented, obvious, a fine shadow, a delicate burn never quite healed. Nothing will erase that little brand. I've stretched it flexed it, held it in the sun, but it will not be exercised. It hangs on like an old unwelcome ghost, a crank spirit biding its time, making mortals wait until the day when, for reasons unknown, it leaves off haunting and suddenly is gone. So he's kind of anticipating that uh -huh. she's going to go away from his life and his mind, but he can't make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the metaphor, uh, the it, the uh, the the ring scar, you know, and made me think of the fact that uh, uh, this thing. I I don't know when the last time I, I had this thing off. I I for years early on when I was younger. I didn't wear it because yeah. because of the kind of job I had. I thought you know I, yeah. it was going to get hung up or something. Right. And then, and then later on, you know, I just got to the point where I thought, well, you know, it's, it's a, and and uh, so I just left it on, and now now it's been on for so so damn long that there's a, there's definitely a, or I don't know if that'll ever yeah, change right. that ring yeah. scar, but yeah, uh, yeah. Are you, you how long have you been wearing that thing? Uh, well, this one I've been wearing for 16 years, yeah, yeah. so and I don't take it off very much either. I, yeah, you know, sometimes take it off to dry my hands. But, right. Well, you know, and, but that's, and that's about it. And and uh, the uh, you know because of the fact that you know the older you get, the less you do anything for that <laughs> yeah, matter. Right. You trim your <laughs> trim your eyebrows. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, yesterday yesterday was my anniversary. So, oh, really? Yeah. So congratulations. I, I, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm still I'm still uh, cooking. Still <laughs> still making it after all these years. Yeah. yeah. Have you been married all your life? Uh, well, uh, I, I was, uh, I was married, uh, previously to my current marriage, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that was only for seven years. And then, uh, and I've been married to Jane Sean, mm -hmm. uh, my current wife for, um, uh, for, for 16 years. Yeah. yeah so, so, so you were a, a bachelor yeah, for yeah. quite well, a while. No, I, I was, yeah. 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 Put loose and fancy I'm, I'm, for you. I'm, I'm more than 16, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous. I've been I've been married since I was a kid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so uh, is there anything else in Ring Scar you wanted to share in there? Well, you thought you might want to um, add to that. The voice is in there. One more for her. Give her one more chance. Yeah, or? yeah. She deserves another chance, doesn't she? So, um, let's see. What what will I give her? Yeah, okay. Well, I kind of like that one, so, yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll give her this one. It's, um, it's, um, she's, um, she's gotten a job, we, we've heard from her previous mm -hmm. uh, soliloquies. These are really all soliloquies because right, they're not right. together. They're just talking to each other even though they're yeah. away. And, and I'm not uh, present. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we know from her previous that she's gotten a job in a new city and she's, mm -hmm. she's moving away. Mm -hmm. And so you go, oh, yeah, this, they really are going to, you know. Break it off. Yeah, that's, they, they already have, but now it's going to be mm -hmm. 
a different phase of that because right. it's going to be long distance, not not over the mountain. It's going to be a long way away. So um, she's she's got this poem. A, a lot of po her poems are reminiscences of things that happened to them before, and she kind of spends a lot of time trying to think about what happened. Mm -hmm. Why can't we be like that anymore? But we can't. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so this poem is called Silly Umbrella. Remember at the zoo, caught in summer showers, I ran into the gift shop and bought this umbrella. The same I packed up to move today. Opened it, peered through rivulets, rain falling off its plastic skin like a large transparent bell. We stood inside, your hand on mine, on the handle, both of us feeling an easy joy, having the place to ourselves with elephants, giraffes, their joy, the break in the heat, seeing all through its print, pale translucent fish swimming its rim, fish that with the gentle curve of umbrella ribs gradually as the eye rose, transformed into brilliant birds flying in tight formations. Birds that, remember, as you looked higher, became fewer and fewer until there remained only a single bur bird impaled on the fiberglass shaft that would not, the saleswoman assured me, quietly draw lightning. <laughs> the silly umbrella. The silly umbrella. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they, they of course, don't draw lightning anymore either, uh, though she's remembering a time when they right. had to think about that. Right. Uh, you know, I, just in listening to those, I mean, you you read four of them. They uh, and and they're and they're, like you say they're 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 kind of soliloquies they're kind of voiced they're definitely voice poems, <clears throat> but still there is a sonnet kind of feel to them. You <laughs> yeah. know what I'm talking about? Yeah, there, there's I a, do. There is a there's a and, and I don't know if that's a subconscious thing that maybe we always pack to the writing of a sonnet. But uh, but there is something about a sonnet. Maybe yeah. it's just the length of it too. I don't know what it is. But. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I, I've always said I teach mm -hmm. creative writing. You know, right. uh, every every semester, and um, and students um, students will before I teach them sonnets, which I do. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, somebody writes a sonnet because yeah. fourteen lines with a with yeah. a switch in the middle of it someplace. Yeah. Yeah. It's just. It's too valuable not to exist yeah, as a yeah. poetic form, and so everybody does it. Even people who don't even know what a sonnet is, right. I say, you know, I'm talking about their poem in class. Well, this is really a sonnet, and we'll talk about that in two weeks, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah. And it isn't an iambic pentameter sonnet, but I'm not so much concerned about that. It's, right. you know, it's yeah. it's the length of a sonnet, which is 14 lines, and it's and it's. Um, and it's rhetorically two parts. It mm -hmm. has a shift in the middle some mm -hmm. someplace, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I consider a sonnet to be, whether it's free verse or, right. or, or uh, you know, iambic pentameter or something else. It, that doesn't matter so much. It's just that it's, is that it has this overall structure, right, which is meant to show change, mm -hmm. which means if you're talking about divorcing couple, it's kind of the irresistible. Well, yeah, form totally. plus it's a, a traditionally love, a, love a, poem. a love poem. Yeah, right, exactly. now it's sort of or an unloved poem, a not love <laughs> poem here. Although I think these people still love each other, they just can't be together anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Life is interesting. Yeah, and it's a, a poem is as good a way as any to try to capture what we don't understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I think it's um, I think it's something you. Um, for that, partly for that reason, anyway, that when you write them, I don't ever know wh where I'm going. I just right. say, okay, here's what I'm talking about, but what right. is my theme? What am I going to say about this? I have no idea, and I kind of don't want to have an idea no, because oh yeah. the more I know what I'm going to say, the more I make the poem say it, and then it comes out forced and like you've 
right. turned it out of a pasta machine or something, just smashed right. it flat. Right. Right. You, and I, I don't want to do that. So <laughs> you get to a point just like, oh man, I hope something happens here soon. <laughs> I got to get out of this thing. Yeah, that's right. I'm throwing <laughs> this one out if it doesn't surprise me in the next three lines. <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> I, w one of the uh, uh, interviews in this whole thing, I mean, this is, I think you're, uh, well, uh, and I don't know what the number is. I keep looking at the catalog and it seems like it changes, but we're right around 60 at this point. Really? So wow. Real close. You may be number 60. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, Corey Williamson. Oh, yeah. She, she mentioned that she had yeah. uh, taken classes with you. C C Corey, Corey's a good friend. She, she didn't really take classes with oh, me. Okay. She, she was a colleague who taught at Carroll oh, with me. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. And she, um, she was an undergraduate at the University of Virginia where I went to graduate school, oh. and she had the same teacher that I had. Oh. Uh, and then she, and she's from Roanoke, and I taught at Holland's College then, Holland's University now. Right. Uh, so, so Corey and I had a lot in common the day we met because right. we had the same teacher and we lived in the same you know, big yeah. Roanoke's a big town. It's about like Billings. It's about that size. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know, we um, yeah. So yeah. and her yeah. office was right next to mine. So we hit it off right off. We did a oh, reading yeah. together here in Missoula at the Festival of the Book. When was that? I don't know. I want to say five or six years ago. So it was probably ten. Because <laughs> at this age, that's what you start to do. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. I. I and I and of course the pandemic is right. Yeah, yeah. Th throwing five or six into a yeah, whole new realm. Right, exactly. Yeah. So uh, yeah, no. I, Cor Corey's a great friend. I'm still in touch with her, and you know. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, I I wondered what the connection was there. I, I, I love her poems. Uh, yeah, she, oh, she's a wonderful. The Sacagawea poems are hers. I just think those are so great. She's a wonderful poet. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it which has been the most fun about doing this and, and sitting with a whole bunch of different yeah. poets that you haven't seen in a long time, some you didn't know, and uh, but just listening to everybody and, and uh, you know, it's like we're, we're pretty wealthy in, in that regard in this little tiny state. We are. Yeah. One of the first things that, um, that Corey and I discovered we had in common is we'd both written a poem that, that referred to Beowulf. Oh yeah, <laughs> both Beowulf fans. <laughs> so that was another one of our first conversations, you know. All right. Because I was reading her book and I went, I got a Beowulf poem too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, and then you know, uh, aside from the the three collections you have in print now, I know you're working on a collection. Yeah, I'm working on a new book, a new kind of book, because mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. You do a certain thing, and right. then you do it for a long time, and it works out great for you. And then, then a day comes when you go, I can't really do that anymore. Right. I got to do something different. Yeah. So I started. Um, oh, how did this get started? I well, I, how it got started is I went fly fishing one day mm -hmm. at. Uh, at this place that I refer to as Alias Creek, because <laughs> I don't tell anybody where it is, though other people know about it. I'm not the only one, but uh, but anyway, I was I was out there and uh, I came home and just sort of wrote down what happened that day. It was a fall day, it was getting pretty cold already. Mm -hmm. it was supposed to supposed to the bad, weather was supposed to be really bad, mm -hmm. and it didn't materialize. So I was I was out there all day, and I caught one fish and. When I left, I just I felt like it had been such a great day, you know, and the cottonwoods were all bright yellow, and right. you know, it's right. just right. the the water was so blue and the sky was so blue, and and there it was supposed to snow the next day, and you go, okay, that's the end of it, you know. And so I just came home and wrote down, kind of wrote down what happened that day, which I often right. do when I'm fishing, and then and then sort of started thinking, well, you know. Maybe I can make something out of that. That was just kind of an essay journal in my journal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I went back and fixed it up, and I included it in here in the stuff yeah. I gave to you so yeah. you could see what I was doing. But um, And I went, okay, I, maybe I'll write a book of essays. That'd be something different. And mm -hmm. then I kind of said, 
Maybe I'll write a book of essays and short stories and poems all mixed together, and what they will all have in common is they will all intersect fly fishing someplace, somehow. Okay. They won't be about fly fishing. Well, some of them might be, but right. mostly they'll just there'll refer a, to fly be, fishing. Be a fish or, in there yeah, somewhere. right. It, somehow it'll get in there. All right. So there's a cancer memoir, for instance, mm -hmm. um, that's a, sort of about fly fishing, but it's really more about a bear that I saw on the stream one day, uh, a little tiny bear. Uh, uh, and uh, there's, uh, there's some short stories. There's a, there's a story about a kid whose father has died and he's trying to make a connection with his dad and he, um, and he does that by, by uh, sneaking off in the car that he's not old enough to drive yet and going fishing at the place where he used to fish with his dad all the time using his dad's fly rod. But, you know, it's not really about fishing. It's about it's about his father son. His, it's about yeah recovering from his father's death and about deciding whether he's going to be friends with anybody else or not. There's mm -hmm. this weird kid who follows him around all the time and actually follows him out to the place where he's fishing, and he's and the kid is so bizarre that everyone in school just sort of ridicules him all the time. Right. And uh, his name is Calvin, and uh, and the main character who's called Bones. Uh, his name is really Jimmy, but everybody calls him Bones. He's trying to decide whether to be friends with this kid who follows him around everywhere, but he doesn't really like that much. <laughs> right, so, right. But that all has to do with male companionship, right. you know, in the face of his missing father. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So is that a story about fly fishing? It's not really. Right, right. But the sort of the, the, the thematic hook is, yeah. is, is the fishing So thing. to speak, yeah. it, And it's interesting, <laughs> you know, I was, uh, well, uh, one of the more recent guests was uh, Chris Dombrowski, and uh, he's a fishing guide here. He mm -hmm. has been for years. And, you know, he did, he did dig up a, a fishing poem. But, I mean, it's like he said, for some reason, he doesn't write a lot of fishing poems. And my other uh, fishing buddy friend, Robert Lee, uh -huh. I, he said, I don't know why I don't write more fishing. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because uh, I had another friend who was a, a, a fishing uh, nut from up the Flathead Way, and he wrote all kinds of fishing poems. Yeah. You know, and he, was, he was always going fishing. And he, but his weren't really about fishing either. They were all about the relationship <laughs> yeah. of what was going on. And, yeah. they were, and there was a lot of humor in his poems. Yeah. And yeah. So uh, anyway, it's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I I'd never written any fishing poems either, and then all of a sudden well, I was writing them. Why don't you read us okay. one of those fishing poems? All right, I will. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, here's one, right on the top. So put it on the top. So that's the one I should probably read, right? Yep. It's got some others that are. Yeah, this one is. Um, this one's kind of. Um, is kind of about how the nicks and scars on our fishing gear <laughs> are a kind of writing that tells the story of mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. so, so it's called Battered Gear. All right. Battered Gear is the warden of memory. Take, for instance, the gouged place on the cork handle of my good Winston rod the header I took down a steep bank on the Gallatin persists there. I slid on my chest, skinned my forearms, but somehow got back to my feet without going all the way down the slope. The rod clattered downhill, and I picked my way down after it, in the process spooking a black bear I hadn't seen out of a tree below. He shimmied rapidly down, butt first, 30 yards away, holding onto the trunk with front claws that made slivers of bark fly. He hit the ground at a dead run. Watching him hurry away, considering whether I myself might not go elsewhere, I picked up that rod that had banged across the rocks and wiped off the dust, and there was the gouge that is now the hieroglyph of that fall, that bear and the sun dogs that fled across the sky all the way home. Such marks release in us remnants of our days of stream, shreds of a past that should have vanished altogether, 
but has been held for us in those flaws, in what we wear, in what we carry. A chronicle of falls, falling body, falling gear, falling water. My fingers gravitate toward the neck on the edge of the reel spool from the one early season float trip when I dropped the rod butt first into the big hole and saw it pogo downstream, miraculously held upright in the current, the reel banging over stones on the bottom, the rod tip standing two feet out of the water. I leaned much too far out of the pontoon boat and caught it so it wouldn't fall over and disappear. Pulled it up quickly and the new fault appeared under my fingers place where the reel had hit repeatedly against the stream bed as it hopped down the river, a scar like an engraving that now says, that place, that day, an insignificant but inscribed a moment that captures as well the far pentlers shrouded in snow, the hard fighting rainbows I caught that day, the beef on rye deli sandwich I had for a late stream lunch. Such moments are unlocked by every small patched or unpatched hole in a raincoat, battered and sweat-stained hats, every scuff and blemish, gear bags filled with intimations, the scripts and scribbling of what is forgotten for a season and then somehow is not. Damage catches and releases it change it to us only to make it our companion so that we carry every day on every stream with us, fishing them all each time we fish anyone until they become strangely one and strangely one with ourselves and our past, not quite as we lived it, but as it lives on in ourselves and our accoutrements, tattooed upon us in places we cannot help but read. Oh, that's, you know, all kinds of things come to mind, uh, <laughs> fishing, uh, fishing stories, fishing trips, not to mention all the scars all over our body, but uh, yeah. is there a working title for this project? Or? Yeah, this, uh, this, uh, this book is, uh, is, is, is called Ephemera. Uh, okay. Ephemera is a, um, well, ephemera means things that don't last, right. you know, th right. things, things in, in, uh, it, it refers also to things in ordinary life that um, th whose time passes somehow, like uh, say an old restaurant menu from a restaurant that no right. longer exists. That's ephemera, right. or or something like that. But ephemera is also a, I think it's a genus of mayfly, or Ooh, okay. uh, and so uh, okay, so uh, fishing tire. Yeah, right. Yeah. So so uh, so so the so that. Uh, that's the title poem. It's a longer poem, but it's um, yeah. But it's thinking about the same kinds of things about how things pass us by, right? And yet somehow they don't pass us by. Exactly. Well, th this has been a delight. I think we're out of time. Okay. Uh, Warren. Well, but but I, I uh, it has uh, been fun. Yeah, we'll have to do another one. You know, I mean, I, I, I why maybe, stop now? Well, I, I, I'm thinking about trying to do podcasts maybe after I, I oh, leave really? this, since my little term is the uh, yeah the uh, the uh, laureate business is yeah. over. So yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, we'll have to do this again. Yeah, absolutely. I have I'd several love things I want to tell you stories about. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, I'm up for it. So All right, we so, can do it. so so look for ephemera. Uh, yeah. and you think it's it's from uh, from Cavan Carey? Um, hope Cavan or? Carey has has the rights mm -hmm. to to my next book. Cool. Generally, they only publish poetry, though, oh, okay. so I don't right, know whether right. they're going to do it because it's yeah. not in their wheelhouse. It's hybrid. Maybe they're going to just read it and say, wow, this is so good. We're going to do something different than yeah. what we normally do. Or maybe not. But yeah. they're very nice people. I like them a lot. So yeah. they've been very, very uh, decent to me. The, the, uh, the owner, in fact, even sent me a, a get well card when I had COVID. Oh. Yeah, we st we tried to do this earlier, and you had COVID. So <laughs> All right, we were going to do. That's I wasn't why, gonna that's be why you're coming 60, in sixtieth. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I think we're out of time, so yeah. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna have to say goodbye to All Lauren right. Graham. Look for ephemera, and uh, I'm I'm hoping we're probably going to do a couple of more of these before I'm through. So maybe we'll see you for another poet in Montana. Take care. Lifetime 
fill 